A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Hey, look at that. We are back. Rebel Force Radio. This is the flagship show. This is the weekly podcast. For those of you who have found us through our Bad Batch after shows, welcome. Great to have you. We got uh, lots of lots of great things to talk about this week. Two trailer reviews. That's right, two trailers. We're going to be looking at the Tales of the Empire trailer, which is really Tales of the Jedi Season 2. We knew that there was a second season coming. What we didn't know is that it was going to be called Tales of the Empire, which is is kind of a cool concept when you think about it, because we know that there's all these classifications of, 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 of people and beings in the Star Wars universe. So you have Tales of the Jedi, Tales of the Empire. You can have Tales of the Sith. Tales of the Republic, Tales of the Bounty Hunters, Tales of the Underworld. There's so many possibilities with this Tales of. My only criticism is uh, let, let's 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 make them longer let, instead of them being shorts. Let's let's do whole seasons of these things. So, but anyway, we've got a review of that coming up. We'll be looking at it scene by scene, clip by clip. Also, the latest game coming out from uh, Ubisoft, Star Wars Outlaws. Star Wars Outlaws will be taking a look at that. Very interesting. You know, the these games are have become so cinematic and 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 so much a part of the fabric of Star Wars storytelling these days. We've got to look at them. We've got to take them seriously because there are canonical ramifications of some of these games. Plus, there's a Jimmy Mack's going to have a review of the Star Wars stuff that's on display at the Disney 100 exhibition in Chicago. So we'll be taking a look at all that stuff and. Um, I, I mean, the, the the main event of this week, if you don't listen to any other part of the podcast this week, you got to check out Puppet Lando's new tune. That's right. Drops tonight as we record this show live. Buckle up, baby. And you better buckle up for this week's Rebel Force Radio. And I know one guy that's buckled up and ready to talk the wars. And that's, of course, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. We are back again. Bad Batch earlier this week. That was an exciting uh, after show with Blake's take taking center stage, of course, and uh, a lot of great speculation and uh, thoughts about how that series is going to wrap up. But uh, this week on RFR, we have so much stuff to talk about. What Jason mentioned in the intro isn't even everything that we have going on here this week on RFR. So uh, I'm I'm ready to jump right in, and I, I'd love. Should we to jump hear right what, in? Let's jump right in. I'd love to hear what you guys think. So uh, let's hit some listener feedback before the main course is served. Let's do it. You must contact me. Play back the entire message. What message? Message after the message. The Emperor commands you to make contact with you. It's a trick. Send no reply. Chat, chat, boys. Chat for Morgan. Uh, just been listening to the uh, Bad Batch after show uh, podcast. I wasn't able to listen to it live, but... um. I got to Blake's take, and he was bringing up how um, Omega and the three Force-sensitive kids are going to link up and do something. I was just thinking, uh, I mean, as far as we know, they they haven't been had any Jedi training. I mean, we don't know that, but I assume they, they don't. They just happen to have a high M count and are 
naturally force sensitive. What if, I mean, this isn't anything crazy, but what if she, you know, helps them tap into something that leads to their escape um, from some stuff she learned from Gunji back in season two? I think that was season two. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think it was season two. But anyway, now, just a thought. Um, keep it up, boys. Looking forward to next week. Have a good one. Hey, thanks, buddy. Thanks for the uh, the voicemail. This did come up on the Bad Bad Chapter show this week, and I think it would be, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but it would be fitting if this character, Jim, that we've speculated or fans have speculated, including us, uh, that, that could have some sort of force potential, Omega, what if her legacy in terms of the force was to bring some of that meditation and some of those sort of core uh, skills, uh, thoughts, ideas to these kids who actually have the high M count, things she picked up from Gunji, things she picked up from um, Asajj Ventress. That would be very interesting, even though she herself is not necessarily a vessel for this type of power, but she could bring some of that discipline, that training, those ideas to these kids that I think would be also very, very cool. In the words of master Yoda, pass on what you have learned and it doesn't take a Jedi or someone even connected to the force to be able to pass along a lesson. I mean, we've seen it in star Wars. If you want to think about Maz Kanata and just the simple things she said, you know, the, uh, the, the life lessons she passed along to Ray seemed to be effective enough to help her out in the battle with Kylo Ren when she did what Ma said, just close your eyes. you know, Close your right. eyes and let the force flow through you. And, and she was able to survive that showdown. Pass on what you have learned. And we clearly know that Omega has learned this skill from the Wookiees. And the Wookiees who are connected to the Force, like Gunji, because we saw Omega practicing meditation earlier this season. Right. So, and, and the characters even said she learned that from the Wookiees. So it seems kind of random for that just to come up all of a sudden in season three. Maybe that's some level of foreshadowing going on. Maybe Omega will have that kind of impact on those kids in the vaults. Interesting I mean, that you bring up other... Maz. You, you know, I, I, it's been a while since I've thought about Maz as a character in the Star Wars universe, and she did seem to be steeped in the lore, in yeah. the letter of the Force and the idea, but never did I think that she was necessarily a Force user but she certainly respected it, understood it to some to the degree that she could. And uh, so, yeah, so it's uh, Omega having sort of a similar role makes a lot of sense. There's yeah. precedent. I mean, you could be steeped in spirituality without having the ability to perform a miracle. Right. But it's like, isn't that what it, faith is all about, is, is passing on what you've learned? And it doesn't matter if you're able to touch the force or not everyone lives in the same plane of existence so life lessons can be passed along from non-force users to force users and have a great impact right right well i think that that i think that there's a great possibility that that could be the role that she ends up playing as she is stuck in this uh a prison with these four sensitive kids like uh, Ava and Jax. I don't remember the name of the Pantoran girl. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't remember her name. But Bluey, uh, Blue, <laughs> Bluey the Pantoran. Well, and there's also the baby, which we didn't see this week. Uh, the uh, 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 Baron, Baron. That was the little uh, baby that they had sort of the oh, cat yeah. had kidnapped. So, the so little, uh, the cat pig, the little, <laughs> little cat pig. She's in there somewhere. Uh, we just don't know where. Maybe she's in the nursery. I don't know. Maybe this is for the older kids in this particular environment. That hey, let me Omega expand on my thought a little bit more because I can't stop thinking about it. Thanks to our voicemail. <laughs> 
Omega also has a relationship with Boba Fett. They're kind of cut mm-hmm. from the same cloth, let's just Literally. say. <laughs> She's the Omega, he's the Alpha. So there's that connection there. And in Star Wars storytelling, you could look at the moment when Boba Fett finds himself amongst allies that he never thought he'd run across, the Tuscans. And mm-hmm. he was able to pass along what he knew to them, like a bantha. Right. You know? I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, it's a joke and a meme and stuff, but I mean, it all sort of plays out. It, it's it's that George Lucas echo that the goes rhyming. on. The, the ring theory, whatever you yeah. want to call it. Yeah, it's like stanzas in a song. <laughs> you know? And, and George used that, I think, as a little bit of a protective bubble because he kept rehashing similar ideas. And if he repeats so I don't himself, know how long goes, Star yeah, Wars. It's all by design. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. George always wanted us to think it was all by design. And I loathe him for that and I appreciate him for that. Yeah. You know, I mean it's kind of a, a tug of war going on there. I always want to have confidence in my storytellers. And while George did have a certain perspective of history that may not have been accurate, he presented it to his fan base as if it were gospel. So I don't mind that, you know, (laughs) as somebody who's being told a story. I want to have confidence in my storytellers. That's why when J.J. Abrams puts his tail between his legs and starts apologizing for Chewbacca not hugging Leia because he didn't recognize the importance of that situation at the end of The Force Awakens, that makes me lose confidence in the storytelling. I lose confidence in the storyteller. I lose confidence in the storytelling. You know, there is an aspect of George where he's almost like uh, Uncle George. He puts you up on his lap and he spins a good yarn you know, and, uh, you know, that uncle that used to be able to tell you a good story, a good bedtime story or whatever, uh, he, he, there was a little bit of, he was a bit of a BSer. There was no doubt about that. That's part of storytelling, right? That's yeah. <laughs> especially when you're telling fake stories is, uh, there's a, there's an art to BSing a little bit. So I don't mind. And I also sort of respect in some ways the way George took, responsibility for his own legacy, his own history, his own, uh, he wanted to be the one that wrote his own yes. story. Yes, yes. And so I kind of, I, I admire that. It's also mm-hmm. fun to look at things like the Icons on Earth documentary that features Marsha Lucas, the secret history of Star Wars, some of these unauthorized, because I don't think that you can really be a Star Wars historian or scholar unless you look at both sides. There's the official take that George has authored through, uh, you know, his own recollection and 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 others, and then there's sort of that unofficial take. You got to really, if you want to know the full story, you got to look at both. But mm-hmm. I but I agree with you. You know, you sometimes you just want to be entertained and put up on the lap and been told a good story. Yep, that's how it's done, baby. That's how it's done. So, well, that was a great voicemail, and yes, uh, let's see you. how it plays out on the Bad Batch. We're only down to three episodes, yeah. and uh, I think we're all expecting something big to happen. So, fingers yes. crossed, something big happens yeah. because I want to maintain my confidence in the storytelling here. So, <laughs> and I and I've had a lot of confidence in the Bad Batch storytelling, although I think it's a it's it's a concept that's being stretched as thin as it possibly can be at this point. I think the three seasons and out is a great, great, uh, great way to handle this series and these characters. And uh, I think we'll look back on this and see that this was a really worthy chapter of Star Wars storytelling. Um, as we talked about on the after show this week, yep, it's been stretched thin. There were a lot of filler episodes in the first couple of seasons, but boy, I will, I'll I'll even give this last week's episode a pass a bit because it has been very focused and very much, um, the, the, the pacing I think has been, uh, the, the, really the, certainly the best of the series and among the best of Star Wars animation. I think when you look at the season as a whole and how it's maintained its pacing, I think it's really been very well disciplined, the storytelling. So Matt McNevents, who is the story editor over there, gets a lot of kudos from me for this season. Yeah, a Clone Wars veteran. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He served in the Clone Wars. (laughs) 
Matt did. And uh, that's where the whole idea was hatched for the Bad Batch during those Clone Wars writing sessions with George Lucas, applying a lot of grease to the skids. He had a lot to do with the, the inception of the Bad Batch. And I don't think that should be forgotten as we're no. winding down the series at this point. No, certainly a, a D. Bad, a D. Bradley Baker, when we've had the chance to talk to him, he I think he wears it as a badge of honor. Oh, he yes. is attached to a series that is really the last major contribution by the maker himself, George Lucas. It's not well, lost as on of D. this point. As of this point. As because of this we point. know George had been working hard on that live action Star Wars Underworld series. That ended up where? On the shelf. (laughs) George's words. That's his quote. Where's the series? It's on the shelf. 50 episodes. And there's Star Wars Detours, which has completed episodes. And George Lucas was personally involved in the creation of that. So it would be funny to watch Star Wars Detours just to get a taste of what George thinks of Star Wars in a satirical way. I, right. I, I think that would be very interesting. And uh, we saw George on stage at Star Wars Celebration. Gosh, do I want to say 2012? Yeah. We sat front row there with Steve Sansweet and uh, and our uh, buddy JC from the uh, Scum and Villainy Canteen. Oh, JC Reifenberg. Yeah, we were yeah. quite the crew. I think JC had a... Uh, Three foot spiked red, um, uh, what do you call those things down the middle of the head? The mohawk, uh, mohawk, the mohawk. <laughs> yeah, a mohawk, yeah. He had a mohawk and it was all spiked up and stuff. And we're sitting there, and Lucas is right there, and it was great, it was a lot of fun. And George was there promoting Star Wars detours. And that was a dozen years ago. He was having a ball up on that stage with Seth Green. He yeah. was just in 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 Matt Senreich. He was having so much fun. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of it was fueled by kind of looking like the cool dad to his his son Jet. You know, bang. Jet was a big you fan, nailed it. right? Of robot Finally, chicken. My kid thinks I'm cool. <laughs> you know, is that what it took? Is that what it took for the right. son of George Lucas? To finally uh, get some credibility yeah. mm-hmm. uh, for his dad, uh, or for his dad to get some credibility with him, is uh, to hang out with Seth Green. He created uh, <laughs> modern <laughs> filmmaking <laughs> to, uh, to some degree. I mean, gosh, it's crazy to think about. Mm-hmm. But well, yeah. you know, Jet um, Jet Lucas, he has advanced into a career in um, in sound. You know, television, movie, sound. I don't know mm-hmm. if he's he's still approaching that, but you know he also got involved in some um, internet startups and and things like that. So you know he's uh, he's out there hustling. Uh, I haven't heard any updates on Jet for a while, but you know best of luck to him, George Lucas's <laughs> son. You know, like you need my luck. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, um, Jim, it was uh, just a couple of weeks ago, our last regular Rebel Force Radio podcast, that you brought us some incredible audio history of Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, and Carrie Fisher in the studio, WGN, 1977, their first and only promotional tour as a trio, yes. uh, if you can imagine, going around the country and uh, making stops and promoting this little independent film called Star <laughs> Wars. Um, and we've had some great, great feedback. As you know, we, we talk about the Bad Batch things that are at the forefront, the current uh, Star Wars, but this goes back to the very foundation and it's, it's humble beginnings. So great feedback on those highlights that we brought you. The entire, by the way, the entire segment uh, is available for Patreon members. So you can check that out. If you're a Patreon member, the all access tier starts at, I believe, $11.38, appropriately enough. <laughs> you can check that out. But um, that wasn't enough. You you have some more for us you wanted to bring uh, in addition to those highlights that we shared a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, the feedback was so tremendous. I, I thought maybe we should shine the spotlight on this incredible find just found in a random closet 
at uh, Chicago radio station WGN and then pass along to me to digitize it. This is a reel-to-reel tape of entertainment reporter Roy Leonard talking to the stars of Star Wars, Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, and Carrie Fisher when they were on their first ever publicity tour for the film. The date was June 16th, 1977, mere weeks after the release of (laughs) the original Star Wars film. And people were already excited about it. It had already gripped the uh, nation uh, soon to grip the world um, because remember Star Wars were, was released internationally sort of on a staggered it, I mean it was released nationally kind of on a staggered level where it opened up in a very small amount of theaters and then just spread like wildfire throughout the country and then months later it was released overseas and in international markets and the rest is history But uh, this is the very first publicity tour for the original Star Wars. So let's go back to June 16th, 1977. We're going to tune our radio dials to 720 AM WGN. And we are going to listen to the Roy Leonard Show as he takes listeners' calls asking these are, you know, obviously very new Star Wars fans (laughs) because... Star Wars itself was very new. This is the coolest and, part, the fact that they're taking listener calls. It's just amazing. Right. And so we have somebody on the line who has se- several questions about Darth Vader. Let's uh, hit the switchboard. I've got three questions about Darth Vader. About the bad guy. Ooh, sure. Huh. Okay. Who played him? David Prowse. Oh, good. I'm right. Huh. Okay. And why does he breathe so funny? Did he have asthma or something? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, why do he breathe so funny? Oh. He's wearing a face mask. A breath with, mask. He has a sort of, it's sort of a portable iron lung. He can breathe in any atmosphere. And there was also a, a rumor that his face was uh, disfigured in the Clone Wars. George has set up this whole uh, history of, of the galaxy. So many of the facts that are in the script... Uh, were you know not in the film for pace for whatever reason but uh we all know our histories and that's that's the interesting part about it there's so much room for uh uh you know for what (laughs) i'm sorry i just i just i just switched to hyperspace i apologize (laughs) okay renee yeah and let's see that was two questions did you have another one yeah i was wondering okay on special effects were most of those animated a lot of them were animated. A lot of them are miniature, uh, miniature models uh, that are. Um, there was a special computer system developed to uh, manipulate the camera platform and the model at the same time. So those were all photographed time, uh, frame by frame. I was wondering, and I, I hope this doesn't spoil the fun of watching the movie. But you know, in the scene uh, when the three of you, along with uh, Chewbacca are escaping, and you have the dogfight where you shoot down the four interceptors. Now, yeah. uh, could you see what you were doing, or is that all put in afterwards? No, it was all put in afterwards. Yeah. yeah. It was a blue screen. I mean, George would say, okay, now look over your right shoulder. They're, they're coming down. Yeah. And you'd, you'd pretend, uh, just the way you sure. pretended when you played Cowboys and Indians, but to see it on the screen is just a thrill for imagine, all of us. Can you imagine, Renee, making money for playing Cowboys and Indians? <laughs> I'd, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> 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 That's... That's great, Renee, with the question about uh, Darth Vader and then the special effects. I, I, I think that it would be, Jim, do you think it might be reasonable to give Charlie Lippincott some of the credit for the incredible oh, PR training oh, yeah. that must have gone in to Her- now, I, And I don't mean this to disparage Carrie and, and, and Mark and Harrison, but I'm just shocked at how... Uh, able they are to answer these questions, their ability to immediately recall. I mean, the fact that Harrison d- detailed the uh, essentially the Dykes reflex, which he's he's referring to there. That's with right. The, uh, uh, the ability to to take these uh, models and, and and make them move on screen. Um, you know, uh, yeah, Charlie Lippincott deserves a, a lot of credit, and certainly the way he prepped these actors to go out and do this publicity. You know, tour. Just, I don't think it's so much of Anybody prepping Mark Harrison and Carrie, it's they they lived through it. This was fresh history for them. But did and they live obviously, through the, what was going on at ILM? That's what's shocking to me. So that story must have been 
being told to them somehow, or maybe they came out and visited. I, I, I really don't know, but... Uh, Harrison has uh, always had a natural curiosity for the mechanics of things. Mm, not surprising. And he leaves no stone yeah. unturned if he's working on a project. And here mm. you're catching him in the moment. Sure. If you talk to Harrison in 2024 about Star Wars, <laughs> he might be like, I don't know, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever they right. want to do. Huh? But here he's in the moment. This yeah. is... He's exper experiencing his own history in real time, along with Mark, along with... How great was it to hear Mark name-check the Clone Wars? Right. In that Crazy. Uh, just random conversation. Yeah, there's this with, story uh, that he's caller. disfigured because of the Clone Wars yes. and all of that. So the disfigured. I mean, there was yeah. never anything in the film that came up that indicated Darth Vader was an actual man. It was right. quite possible he was a droid yeah. to film goers of 1977. Did you think he was a robot or a robot, as it, people it, back then no, called it? No, we, we called them droids back then. Oh, okay. um, there was always that kid on the playground who had an older brother who knew everything. Oh. Uh -huh. And the older brother had revealed to us a lot of information about Darth Vader. Especially the uh, fight on a volcano with Obi Wan mm. Kenobi, mm -hmm. and the fact that he is a man underneath that helmet, completely disfigured. So that the was... novelization, the George Lucas novelization, that was uh, of course ghost written nope. by uh, oh, Alan Dean Foster. Alan Dean Foster sort of reveals that he he is a man underneath that. that oh, costume. does it? Is is there a, a a, a well, they, they they refer to the fight on the volcano. That is they do. in the novelization. In yes. the novelization, I don't think so. I do not mm. think so. The first reveal of to us as fans about Darth Vader's backstory, suffering his wounds as a result of a saber duel with Obi Wan Kenobi on a volcano, as it was you know place was there, there was no Mustafar, right. there was no. Lava planet, it was a volcano, and the word was was that Obi Wan had overcome Darth Vader and kicked him into the volcano. And when Vader emerged, right. he needed the cybernetics to survive. That first appeared in a George Lucas interview with Rolling Stone magazine late in the summer mm. 77. Did it that creep the, into one of the did it creep into the Return of the Jedi novelization? Oh, quite possibly, yes. Maybe that's what now, I'm thinking Now of. I think you're on the right track. Yeah. That novelization okay. written by James Kahn, who's from Chicago, and who we got to meet at Star Wars Celebration 2015 when you and me hosted the behind-the-scenes stage for that entire convention. That's right. Yes. James hung on with us backstage, and he was so cool. And I had my Return of the Jedi novel that I bought <laughs> at the Walden Books back in... Early 83, and I had him sign it. And, um, you know, but he's a guy we never spoke to here on the show. I think that's what I'm, I, I think that's what I might be remembering. It wasn't in the novelization. So there's nothing in the novelization, the Alan Dean Foster no. ghost written novel that would would conclusively say that, that Darth Vader is not a droid, in fact, is a person underneath. Okay. The only so, thing we knew about Vader. In 1977, was he was a former Jedi Knight. Mm -hmm. He was a former pupil of Obi-Wan Kenobi's who fell mm -hmm. to the dark side. He fought in the Clone Wars. Yes. He betrayed and murdered Anakin Skywalker. Yes, he killed Luke's father. Mm -hmm. well, that's pretty much it. That's yeah. all we know about him. Doesn't seem too droid-like, but it could be. Well, you know, with with three PO walking around, right, so, you know, right, maybe. But no, he did. He never did. Pull like Dave Prowse never walked like a robot or anything. No, he's, never. He never. He's, he always seemed. And then there's the breathing, which yes. also indicates humanity underneath the helmet and armor. So, um, you know, but I mean, these are mad questions we were asking ourselves in the summer of 77 about this film. 
and the uncertainty about it all. But like I said, there was always that kid on the playground whose older brother subscribed to Rolling <laughs> Stone magazine, and he was ready to dish out the deets. <laughs> all right, Jason, we got somebody else on the switchboard. All right, we have who do we got? We got somebody who wants to talk about, I don't know, caller, what's your question about? Who? For uh, Harrison. Yeah. Uh, his, uh, his talk with the, uh, shall we say, burr-headed green friend he had in the cantina scene, yeah. that, was, that was the most uh, hilarious thing I had to see with the, uh, with the uh, subtitle. <laughs> that, oh, was, that was Greedo, by the way, Greedo. Greedo is his name. <laughs> Yeah, and greed is his game. <laughs> You're uh, taking care of the intercom in the detention center. Hilarious. That had to be the most fantastic part. Okay, the force be with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, boy. You know what? <laughs> she understands great comic delivery and timing with his, uh, we're all fine here now. Uh, how are you? And then uh, Greedo. I love that Mark is just like, yeah, it's Greedo. You know, he just wants to get right at, up in there and... Uh, yeah, I know these names. It's Greedo. You're and attracted Harrison. to Mark's reaction. I like Harrison going, Greed is his name. Greed is his game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they just seem, it's just, it's what a great time capsule because they're just on top of the world. They know that they've got a hit on their hands at this yes. point. Uh, I don't think they, obviously, you don't know what, how big of a hit, but they know they have a hit. And, um, yeah, it's just a, it's it's an incredible. Uh, like I say, it's a time capsule. So check it out if you're a Patreon member. All accessed here. The entire interview can be uh, listened to. And what a what a treasure it is. And the fact that we're kind of exclusively unearthing it here on Rebel Force Radio <laughs> probably hasn't been heard since. Uh, Jim, any evidence that this has been heard since '77? None whatsoever. All we have is the real the real tape. As far as I know, I'm the first one to digitize it and make it listenable for audiences in the mm. uh, in, in this century. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, um, thinking. Uh, speaking of strings, you got Pinocchio. Uh, and all of that. Uh, did you go to this Disney 100 exhibition that oh, was this in was Chicago? So cool. Yeah, this was, was a this? great time. It's a place called Exhibition Hub. And mm -hmm. the Walt Disney Archives has opened up its vault of various film treasures, props, uh, art, tons of great objects. Uh, some of the Disney crown jewels are on display. A hundred years. It's incredible exhibit. Think about. Yeah, it's it's a, a really hundred great hundred years. It's interactive. It's fun. It goes all the way back to things like the original Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, all the way up to current Disney stuff, um, and even Pixar, Star Wars, and Marvel. It was a, a great time to uh, go see this exhibit. I, I believe it closes this weekend. Oh, so, all right. Um, well, if you're listening to this, <laughs> you only have probably hours, uh, maybe a day or so to right, uh, check maybe. it out for yourself. If you're Is lucky. this a traveling exhibit? Is this something that might be going elsewhere? It's going to Kansas City next. Okay. And it's currently on display in London. But that's as far as the reach goes. And uh, it was a really cool exhibit. It had all these great classic Disney artifacts, like um, at the beginning of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, they have this book that opens up, and uh, they have the book prop there. Oh, wow. You could look at it and see all the detail and lots of costumes from and artwork from classic Disney films like Peter Pan to the... Dalmatians to uh, even newer stuff like Encanto and and things like that. Did but, you uh, and the whole only... family go out there? I oh, know of course, that Dylan of course. is a big big Disney fan. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He was uh, he was definitely in his element at this exhibit. So I shot some video of the Star Wars display and I wanted to share it with you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we have it going on right here. This is, you see, this is the entire display. It was about what four or five, six, six different little things like Han Solo's dice from the Solo film. All right, I got to pause this because I want to know. Okay, <laughs> here it is. This is the Oribesh dice. Is it? Right? Is that Oribesh? That's that's the Oribesh dice, not to be confused with. <laughs> the original dice, and I only say this because I'm a proud owner, 
uh, the original Dice Maker, this was many years ago, mm -hmm. prior to the sequel trilogy coming out. Uh, the original Dice Maker of the dice that were seen on the Millennium Falcon in A New Hope, they were just traditional dice. They were gold, obviously. But he, uh, Jim, do you remember this? When he went out online and said, hey, uh, I'm going to recast these just for a limited time. Yeah, I remember uh, you guys jumping and I, at it. We I jumped. We, I, we, I personally we, didn't, but we got a set, and they were <laughs> cast out of the same molds. And what what's interesting about this prop is that at that time they were traditional dice, like the dice that you would find, you know, with a with a board game in the sense that it has the, you know, the one dot, the two dots, the three dots, etc. And then when this became a thing with the Force Awakens. And by the time they showed up on The Force Awakens, they were these Oribesh dice. So they were sort of redone in, yeah. a, in, a, in, a, in a way. But uh, so, yeah, these are the Oribesh dice. And they show up again in Solo as well. Well, you know, or Oribesh didn't exist at the time of the original Star Wars film. You actually see English letters on certain things like the tractor beam controls that Obi-Wan adjusts, that's in English. Where did, I think Orbesh came about uh, for The Empire Strikes Back when, uh, I think the first time we see it is when Luke is flying away from Hoth with R2 in the back slot of the X-Wing fighter. And Luke starts talking to him and you can see the readout on the screen of what R2 is saying. That's the translation mm. of his beeps and boops. And it was in <laughs> Orbesh. And it's been that way since the original release in 1980. So that's when Star Wars... I would love to know, actually, the origins of Orbesh. Mm. Who actually came up with the design. It's an original trilogy design. I sure. believe for the most part. Maybe it was just random stuff at first always, and then somebody developed thought, it into a, an actual yeah, alphabet. Exactly. I always thought it was a bit of a response to Jim, if you recall back in the eighties, uh, the early eighties, that's when Klingon first became kind of, a oh, yeah. considered a, 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 an actual language and linguists were brought in <laughs> to expand it. The right. Klingon dictionary came out. And I always thought that Oribesh was sort of Star Wars's response to mm. Klingon. I never felt it was the response to Klingon. I, I, I felt that way when in the expanded universe, in the Karen Travis novels, she had devised a language for the Mandalorians called mm. Mandoa. That's and right, I saw, yes. I'm like, now there's your response <laughs> to the Klingon freaks in trekkie dumb. <laughs> hey, which I was one, you know. I, I got the audio book, How to Speak Klingon. I got that. Oh, you, you get a degree in it in some universities. That's true. That's true. <laughs> now, I never sat and listened to try to learn it. I, I got it because it was funny for radio bits. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. I can only imagine. So there's an audio book version of the Klingon dictionary. Wow. You talk. You talk. Blah, blah. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to the okay. Disney All 100 right. Star Wars exhibit. Here's a poor puppet. And uh, when I uh, see these things, you know, Star Wars props, um, I, I love to look at the detail. Yeah. And so when I'm shooting video, I zoom in big time. To really get a feel for the craftsmanship and the detail and everything. And here we see the dead black stare of the eyes of yeah. the poor puppet. Now, here's BB-8. This is the real centerpiece of the exhibit. I have an affinity for BB-8 because, Jim, do you recall back at Star Wars Celebration, one of them, right before The Force Awakens came out? Yeah. We happened to be looking at some of the displays that were there. And just as luck would have it, as we were looking at the BB-8, we knew nothing really about BB-8 right. at the time. I think maybe we'd seen the teaser. That was pretty much it. And some of the original or some of the, the guys that had worked on the original BB-8 puppet, or excuse me, uh, model, yeah. uh, robot, 
were working on the display when we happened to be there and we we chatted with them a little bit and i remember one thing that came out of that was they kept to, you know calling bb8 a he so we yeah. knew that bb8 was a was 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 a guy was a right. dude uh, but what a treat that was. That was really cool. So I always feel kind of an affinity for BB-8 because of that sort of serendipitous moment we had. Well, it was it was a funny moment because uh, I think they were the guys who are the actual performers of it. Yeah. And it is a puppet. It's it's a puppet. They attach these handles to the thing and roll it around. And, I mean, there is a model that used via remote control. But a lot of the times it's just these puppeteers who are guiding it around and all of that stuff gets painted out digitally. Right. So uh, these guys were in there. <laughs> yeah. They kept referring to BB eight as he, and I remember at the time on the internet, there was a lot of talk about BB eight, like shifting genders because they changed the, the sound effect that accompanied BB-8. Mm. And first he had a very different sound. And then they switched it up to more of a chirpy, beepy thing. And people are like, oh, BB-8 sounds like... I mean, it just sounds absurd to say it. BB-8 sounds like a girl now. <laughs> and, and so people are saying that. and uh, But the guys kept referring to BB-8 as he. And so I said, masculine programming? And they were just like, oh, shoot, we've said too much. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, they were all weirded out about it. They but were. I, I, I think BB-8 uh, does have the the masculine programming. I sure. think he's been referred but how, to But just how he. cool that we just happened to be in there at the time that they were working that on crazy. that display. Yeah. That was crazy. And it was a, a cool thing to happen. So I zoom in. I want to see what BB-8's little radar eye looks like. And there's a lot of detail in there. And you see the uh, artificial scuffing and aging of the droid all around it. You know, this is the work of artists. It's not actual usage. Maybe some of it is. Here's a cool thing. It's those books that uh, Ray had stashed away or... She found in the hollowed out tree trunk on Octu. Here's one of the books they actually had on display. It's like looking at, you know, the original Bible or something. Wow. As we zoom into it, very dramatic. But you see, there's a lot of detail there. Um, and it's a uh, very, the craftsmanship of these props are outstanding. Here's the Skywalker late, lightsaber hilt from The Rise of Skywalker. This is the one that was split in half in. The Last Jedi and, and soldered together by Ray. And they had a full First Order Stormtrooper set of armor on display. So in my video, I zoom in. I get a real close look at what's going on with this First Order Stormtrooper. And I get down to his shoes and I see he's wearing Keds that have been spray painted. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> oh, what you get. You know, very high tech. <laughs> look you know. at that. They won't notice on the film. Yeah, but guys, this stuff becomes museum exhibits after a while. You got to really tighten it up. I remember when Keds people called that it are the, spray painted. Uh, they so, called all the, right, and there you have this, the whole display. But there was this one other cool thing at the end. It was like this hall of mirrors that was cool. showing all of this Star Wars, all these Star Wars visuals on it. Um, you know, clips from all films of the trilogy. Look at that. And it was a walls. real trip wow. to walk through this thing and uh, experience it. Of course, the sound was. This was big like and Jimmy's dreams. If you ever want yeah, to know this what really like to is, Jimmy's yeah, head. yeah. <laughs> the hall of mirrors. And there's the statue of Walt Disney with Mickey Mouse. And. Uh, that's the end of the tour. So it was wow, really a lot so of fun. Cool. Yeah. So would you recommend this if uh, there, you're in Kansas City or in oh, the absolutely. Uh, in the market for something like this? Uh, check it out. It's great. Also, I mean, just you know, the Disney history is is very thick throughout the whole exhibit, and you see a lot of things that you'll connect to just as a person, and um, it, it's a great walk through the entire timeline of Disney from. The animation to the live action to the parks, it's all very, the music, the sound effects, everything is very heavily represented in this thing. More than 250 artifacts, works of art, 
costumes, props, just amazing memorabilia. It's a really, really fine display, and, and I knew it would be of interest to us as Star Wars fans to see some of the Star Wars props they had on display at this thing. So always a thrill. I would have preferred a little more original trilogy stuff in there. It was all prequels, but, you know, you take what you can get. And uh, to see it all in the flesh, in person, is very impressive. Yeah, it's always a treat. Uh, It never gets old when you see that stuff. The uh, exhibit they had, the Mandalorian exhibit that they had at Star Wars Celebration Chicago was just uh, out of sight. Anaheim. Anaheim, sorry. Anaheim was, um, I think, probably, we said it was, at the time, it was the best collection of exhibits for any, uh, uh, as far as all those artifacts, uh, just absolutely incredible. And it helped it was out there in California where they shot the show, so it was Mm -hmm. easier. Um, But, uh, yeah, it doesn't get old. It doesn't get old seeing that stuff. No, it doesn't. And uh, I was getting similar vibes from seeing this particular exhibit. So if you're in the Chicago area this weekend, uh, today or tomorrow, get over to Exhibition Hub and check out a cool Disney exhibit that features Star Wars, also Marvel. There's Marvel stuff there. I I saw Captain America's shield. Oh, wow. Very empowering, very empowering. (laughs) So (laughs) it was a great time, yeah, and great for families. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, if you're in the market for more Rebel Force Radio, there's one place that you should be going. That's over at Patreon. As we said earlier, uh, Patreon supporters at the uh, all-access level and above get the entire, that's right, the entire interview that we were able to uh, share with all of you a couple of weeks ago and some highlights just a few moments ago of the original cast of Star Wars, Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher on WGN Radio, and that's just scratching the surface of what's available for you on Patreon. That's right, Jason. It's been really busy over at Patreon the last few weeks. In addition to offering the complete rare Star Wars radio interview that you just heard highlights from, from back from 1977, uh, RFR Q&A still keeps pumping out weekly episodes available to all members who uh, support RFR on Patreon. The most recent ones, uh, RFR Q&A number 199, Top 10 Star Wars Vintage Toy Sounds with Joe Dallas. And uh, Joe quizzes me by playing um, these electric sound effects that simulate ship engines, blasters, and cannons, whatever. And he made me guess (laughs) what ship it was from the vintage Kenner era, so you could play along at home with that. I feel one. like in my memory, they're all the same. They're all the same sound, but I guess they're, they're, they're they are they <laughs> are yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. Your memory uh, is pretty sharp, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> also, RFR RPG is back with. Uh, we actually wrap up our our uh, most current game campaign, the Battle for Whisper Base. It reaches its epic conclusion with uh, Carnage surrounding him on the battlefield. Podcastus, our hero, Podcastus, has been severely injured. And his only hope for a last-minute rescue is Grando the Grand, (laughs) played by Tyler Page. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, will we escape certain death? You have to listen to find out. That's RFR RPG, of course. Everyone on RFR, well, not everyone, Insider Plus and above get early bird releases, ad-free releases of every episode that we produce. Um, And the latest episode of RFR Q&A is RFR 200, RFR Q&A 200 with Tyler Page. We uh, decided to honor our 200th episode of the Q&A featuring a conversation with a special guest VIP, official RFR show observer, Tyler Page. Now, I, I, hate to, I hate to throw uh, these kind of accusations, but I'm just a guy that is doing the after shows and reading all the chats. And Tyler and his beard, I got to tell you, are a big hit with the lady fans of Rebel Force Radio, <laughs> the lady listeners. Oh. 
They all just, oh, every time we show Tyler, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. all these heart emojis start showing up in the chat. Yes. Uh, he is definitely a... Uh, <laughs> He's definitely a fan favorite. Uh, yeah. I mean, really, I, I've seen it in real life, in real time, right in front of me. How, uh, <laughs> yes, you know, that, that beard does attract. Now, he has trimmed it down. Yes. You know, yes, he has. his beard was so thick, he could fold it over his face and watch the eclipse. <laughs> it was so, it was perfect. But the Who eclipse. Needs the glasses. <laughs> the eclipse burned the beard off his face, apparently. So he's, uh, you know, he's ready for summer. You know, he's 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 not doing the ZZ Top anymore. But uh, give him a couple weeks; it'll be back. So, but it was great. You know, we love Tyler, and we appreciate him so much for everything he does here for us at RFR. So, I really wanted to get to know a little bit about him as as far as his history in Star Wars, his history with RFR, all that stuff. We 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 discuss on RFR Q and A two hundred, and uh, all wow, the RFR VIPs episodes. are yeah. And Dang. we got the yeah you know, we got the you know next three months all plotted out with RFR VIPs, all scheduled to host uh, sessions of RFR Q and A with me, going into the midsummer. It's gonna be great, and and also everyone is really pumped up for RFR Live on May the fourth in Bristol. So that's gonna be a great time as well. And uh, if you come out to that, you'll be able to meet many of our RFR VIPs who will be in attendance. And uh, along with a few other surprises, I hope. Surprises for yes. us <laughs> is what it will yeah, be. Yeah, and but. The, the best way to uh, check out those details is to go over to rebelforceradio.com, and you'll see this little May the 4th banner over in the right rail, and you just click on that, and that sends you where you need to go to get your uh, all of your uh, information and your tickets. Uh, and there's also a story that gives you all of the details Right there, again, on rebelforceradio.com if you need hotel accommodations. All available there at rebelforceradio.com. And we thank, uh, of course, all of our Patreon supporters for their support of us here at RFR. And, uh, wow, we just we never take it for granted. So as a little treat, I shouldn't say a little treat, a big <laughs> treat, coming up right now, we have the latest drop. That's what the kids call it. Yeah. The drop. The latest drop from... Puppet Lando. I didn't even know about this, folks. You think, yeah. oh, well, you know, Jason is the co-host. He's got to know about these things. I don't know until I open up my email and I see that Puppet Lando has been busy in the recording studio and has dropped his latest on us. And uh, apparently it is a buckle up baby. <laughs> buckle up. And this is epic. I mean, this is like the the peak, I think. Of Puppet Lando's recording Ooh. career at this, his point. artistry has peaked. <laughs> I, 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 it can't get bigger than this. This show, <laughs> this song, not only features the vocal stylings of a Mr. P. Lando, but also features on drums, bass, guitar, trumpet, and keyboards RFR listeners, and they all take solos. So really? listen closely to this song. You'll hear. Ben Roloff on drums, Joe Dallas on bass and trombone, Ian Savage on guitar, Charles Maclean on trumpet, and Jeff Ulysney on keyboards. And of wow. course, Jeff Ulysney also serves as Puppet Lando's producer. And uh, I mean, really, Puppet Lando is so, Jeff's muse at this point. Or maybe it's the other <laughs> was, way around. Was I'm was never really a, sure. A, a, a crowdsourced uh, collect, but this was a collaboration. It was crowdsourced across the RFR listening audience. Yes, featuring additional voices by RFR listeners. Wow. And we'll go through that uh, roster after the song is over. But uh, this is a team effort led by our leader, the Puppet Lando. So I uh, am so excited to present Puppet Lando with the Rebel Force Radio Orchestra. <laughs> In his uh, latest song, Buckle Up Baby, making its world debut here on Rebel Force Radio. All right, man, what do you want to do? You want to do, uh, you want to buckle up? Yeah! You want to buckle up, baby? Yeah. Drums, you ready to do Buckle Up Baby? Yeah, let's do it. 
All right, can I count it off? Oh, All right, here we go. A oh, one, two, three, four. Just sit here at my side. Adventure's calling us, so baby, buckle up. Buckle up, baby. The galaxy is ours. Buckle up, baby. For the next couple hours, adventure's calling us, so baby, buckle up. We'll travel down the castle run. Only 12 past six. Then we'll go to my private moon Where we'll have lots of Fun Buckle up, baby The Empire's on our tail Buckle up, baby They'll throw us both in jail We're going to light speed So baby, buckle up Chewy, punch it Give me a little guitar. Blow that horn, Chuck. Dallas, take us to the rebel base. It's all you, Ben. about this band, ladies and gentlemen? Well, these cats swing harder than a Twi'lek key party, if you know what I mean. And I'm pretty sure you do. Take it back to the top, fellas. Standing ovation to this! Wow, Swank is As standing. It, I I am. I, I you're getting a standing o. 
Uh, there you incredible. Go. As a, you know, I love the Great American Songbook. I love, <laughs> love uh, stand up singers Sinatra, Bobby Darin, uh, Dean Martin, Tony Bennett, Sammy Davis Jr. And now I think we can officially say Puppet Lando. I mean, he is definitely taking his, his place amongst the upper echelon of the stand-up singer, the saloon singer. <laughs> Incredible. And in and, and all seriousness, I mean, the artistry and the musicianship that our listeners have displayed in this incredible uh, crowdsourced composition, it's incredible. Wow. Amazing, amazing, amazing. This is definitely the showstopper, the 11 o'clock number. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great. I got to give props off again to uh, Ben Roloff on drums, Joe Dallas on bass and trombone, Ian Savage on guitar, Charles McAlien on trumpet, and Jeff Ulysney on keyboards and overall arrangement, plus additional voices by loyal RFR listeners, Joey Meyer, Mike Tenney, Rod, no, I'm sorry, not Rod Stewart, Rob <laughs> Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Schlick, Ron Keplinger, Kennedy Drake, Jeffrey Clark, and Todd Suds Sedlick. And this song will be made available on Bandcamp. You can download it and uh, support Puppet Lando and Jeff Ulysny and uh, keep the studio uh, humming for more Puppet Lando songs. We are still considering that vinyl mm. release. I keep saying it. And it's going to happen. If I keep saying it, I will I was looking uh, over at the turntable it. here, and I was thinking, yeah. wow, wouldn't it be great to spin Puppet Lando on the old hi-fi? That would be great. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, by popular demand, it could happen. How many how many tracks are we up to now? Well, that's a good question. I think we have enough for at least an EP. An EP. Uh, but, okay. uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to see what we can get cooking here with a Puppet Lando vinyl. <laughs> Just to sort of pay tribute to the fact that Billy D. Williams, when he first started his career in the 60s, put out his own album yes. of uh, show tunes and, uh, you know, soon-to-be jazz standards and things like that. Right. So, uh, maybe Puppet Lando is, is on that same trajectory as... Uh, Billy D, the great Billy D. Williams. So, thank you everyone who was involved in Puppet Lando's latest hit, Puppet Lando and the Rebel Force Radio Orchestra. Buckle up, baby! Incredible, incredible. Just imagine when Puppet Lando gets around to writing his tell-all book. Uh, Billy <laughs> D has written his. Wait, wait till Puppet Lando. <laughs> yes. I can't, can't imagine. Too hot for the publishers, I would guess. <laughs> this is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the force with Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. The galaxy is listening. Well, let's uh, check into news. Lots of things happening in the headlines. So let's see what's going on right now. I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer. I have good news. All right, one of two trailers we're going to be looking at. Uh, two big drops. You know what happens? We take a couple of weeks off on the flagship uh, Rebel Force Radio weekly podcast, and we get two trailers. So we're going to start off with uh, a video game trailer. This is for Star Wars Outlaws, and um, this is coming out of uh, Ubisoft or Ubisoft and uh, Massive Entertainment, an open world AAA console game. Set between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, focusing on the main protagonist, K. Vess, Gun for Hire. Yeah, Gun for Hire. Uh, she'll work for the all, any any of the uh, criminal syndicates mm -hmm. just to get herself uh, into uh, in and out of a lot of trouble. So that was the. Um, the description that we were given a couple of months back before we saw this trailer, and now we've got the uh, official trailer here. And, Jim, as I was saying at the top of the show, these are relevant because these video games, as we saw, uh, you know, with Cal Kestis, or as uh, you're fond of referring to him, Cal Kestis. Uh, Kestis. 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 Catsup. Catfish. Catfish. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, but these things do have often canonical ramifications. Yes. So uh, we want to take a look at this official trailer. We're also going to be looking at that Tales of the uh, Empire trailer in just a few moments. But let's let's start off with this one. And I got to say, you know, at first I was like, well, you know, should I really care about this? I'm not much of a gamer, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. there is a cameo that shows up in, in this trailer that I think is of great interest. No, there's Star a Wars few fans. cameos in this trailer, I think. And also, you know, we did cover it when they first made the announcement about this game and showed footage. And I think uh, we universally decided that it was something that looks pretty damn interesting and might be worthy of our pursuit once it becomes released. I've been trying to tell Swank forever to play <laughs> Jedi Fallen freaking order. Yes. But he's, you know, he's he's still too busy with his <laughs> his lifestyle you know, <laughs> to let to let awesome Star Wars video lifestyle. games get in the way, you know. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what though? One of the things that's cool in this Outlaws is that um as this character, as K Vess, uh, yes. you can work for all these various syndicates, including Jabba the Hutt. That's pretty cool. And What's also all interesting is that you can sort of make your own path uh, in this, although there is a canonical ending that all players will go through. Mm. So that tells me that obviously this has potential for having some canonical ramifications in the Star Wars universe at large. Uh, yeah. Also of note is that this is not one of those games that's going to take hundreds of hours to finish. No. Uh, so that's good to know. So this is, you know, I, wanna, I don't want to say this is for casual gamers, but if you think you got to devote hundreds of hours to it, uh, you don't. So oh. might be more entry level, I guess. It takes a little bit of the pressure off. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the big part of me when it comes to some video games, especially the ones that seem like they're never ending, is the commitment you make to the game. And I'm not right. someone who likes to leave things unfinished. You know, says the guy who's been playing Jedi Survivor for the last year and sees no <laughs> end in sight, you know. But, hey, I take my time. I savor it, you know. It's like video game time to me is something kind of special and sacred. It's not something that happens all the time. I don't want to so, rush into it and, and, and worry about what's going on outside the room. You want to make sure that you have time for it so you can yes. envelop yourself into the universe. And, uh, yeah, it's special. I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. And so you put aside that time. You, you can lose yourself in the experience, the environment, the action and everything, and it's a lot of fun. I don't just play video games as a part of my day-to-day -day existence. When I play... It's special. It's it's like a treat for me to yes. be able to sit down. So I'll stretch these suckers out for years if it takes <laughs> that. But I will finish the thing. But like I said, Jedi Survivor, been playing it for a year. I see no end in sight. And I'm good with that. But I would like to get it done with by the time Outlaw comes out. Because this game looks very interesting. Each of you represents some of the most powerful criminal organizations in the galaxy. Pikes, Crimson Dawn, Huts. Yes. It's a golden age for the underworld. That guy. Golden age for the underworld. So this is set between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. This is considered to be a golden age for the underworld, the syndicates, all of that, because the empire is more than happy to let them sort of take the lead uh, and grab all the headlines. And uh, as the empire sits in the background and, you know, does what it's doing in terms of taking away people's rights and freedoms and all that stuff. This guy is a character from the star Wars criminal underworld who was first seen in the actual Marvel star Wars comics uh, from a couple of years ago that featured Kira and the Crimson Dawn syndicate war. That was a story thread that ran through Marvel for a couple of years. And uh, he's someone who was an associate of Crimson Dawn. 
and uh, someone who uh, Kira tried to work with, tried to uh, manipulate, you know, to act against the Huts, the hmm. Hut Syndicate. So they were all like button heads at this one point. Um, and and when did that happen? This is, I think this is a little bit later in the timeline. Yes, it's between Empire and Return of the Jedi. That's where the Marvel Comics has been focusing on for the last few years. This game takes place in that period, yeah. Yes, indeed. The Empire controls every corner of the galaxy, but they're distracted by a rebellion that won't quit. It's an opportunity to make millions. Nice. Uh, interesting. So, you know, this the, the, the Empire, which is seems to be more than happy to let the, uh, the the syndicate sort of sort of take the lead, take the headlines. But at the same time, the syndicates themselves see this as an opportunity to really flourish because the empire is distracted by the rebellion, the, the mm-hmm. seeds of rebellion. They're, it's whack-a-mole. They, they just keep trying to um, pour water on all of these little uh, fires that are erupting throughout their galaxy. And at the same time, the syndicates then are able to sort of seize control and do what they want to do for the most part unfettered. And this seems to be very much along the lines of what Jim, you were referring to earlier about the star Wars underworld series that George Lucas had conceived of uh, many, many years ago. Right. Yeah. The Pike syndicate was supposed to play a major role in Star Wars Underworld as well. And they've been revived. And I believe you see a Pike, a member of that crime family, show up here in this trailer at a certain point. But right now we're sitting around the table with um, with Zarek Besh and uh, some other warlord. There's a Pike right there. But he's not wearing the, the cool helmet they wear. I, he's got more of the, you know, he's got the fishy head. And I, I prefer the helmeted pike. That's, they were yeah. more mysterious. But then they emerged um, without helmets on in the Boba Fett series. And so now I guess that's how we have to look at them all the time. I liked them better with the helmets on. They seem more kind mysterious, of agree, yeah. creepy. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, he looks like uh, Akbar's kid brother here to me. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the one nobody talks about anymore at the family <laughs> reunions. <laughs> right. Uh, and then we go around the table here, and he's naming off the various uh, syndicates. And that's, and, uh, um, is that a Zizor? Uh, 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 what do you that's call a, them? A Faleen? Uh, a Faleen. I don't think that's a Faleen. But this is definitely a weak way. Oh, that's a weak way. Yeah. Uh, the lighting is piss poor. So another <laughs> another new thing that's going on with Star Wars and all across the board in Hollywood is, uh, you know, you don't get to see the cool stuff no more. Everything's in the shadows. <laughs> right. Oh, you go, all you have to do is adjust your blah, 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 and your blah, blah, blah on your TV, and it's fine. <laughs> Oh, if that's the truth, then how come every screen grab I see online, even those that come from official sources, are just as dark and impossible to see? <laughs> you tell me I got to adjust something? Adjust your eyes. Can't see nothing. It's a golden age for the underworld. The Empire controls every corner of the galaxy, but they're distracted by a rebellion that won't quit. It's an opportunity to make millions. And here's K Vess. K Vess, which is a kind of a, I guess, a female Han Solo is sort of the vibe right. that I'm getting. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's this as if, if, if George Lucas casted uh, Jennifer Lawrence as Han Solo <laughs> instead of Harrison Ford. This, this is, is who what we you get. get. This is K Vess. K Vess. K Vess. What, what's it? Stop for a second. What's with all the female protagonists in Star Wars? K, May, Ray. I mean, the, <laughs> do you see a pattern here? Do we sense do a, pattern? a pattern? I see right. a pattern. I hear a pattern. Enough for sure. All right, here we go. K Vess, the underworld's favorite new scoundrel. Oh, she's a scoundrel. Look at this. Uh, what is this? A. Uh, 
This is a Sulliston? Yeah, that's a nine numb. He looks like a nine numb. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a cousin of nine. And you see why they wear those those floppy hats all the time is because you don't want to be they looking at the scrotum head of theirs. <laughs> what did what did Billy D say in Robot Chicken? You're like a short stock of pancakes. <laughs> that's exactly what he looks like. <sighs> we need it last. What do? You- Who's this? Is this the same dude? No, this is a different. No, dude. that's an that's another scoundrel. Okay, and he's mm-hmm. he meets K for the first. They they're probably two bounty hunter pirate scoundrel types that have large reputations, and they're meeting each other for the first time, which means maybe a collab is in their future. She pulls ah. a blaster on him. The second uh, she sees him, and he's just sitting there, like, having a drink, you know? What do you want? Zarek Besh. They're new, rich. Hmm. The Besh. This is what I'm talking about. Okay. So this is, uh, they're introducing something new, I think, into the canon here. Yes. They're new, rich, and lethal. You cross their boss, Sliro. Rob his fortune, buy your freedom. This job, it's a death wish. Okay, now check this out. This this grabbed my attention. I'm so in. we've got, uh, is she staring at Han Solo in Carbonite here? This does take place between Empire and Jedi. So yeah. something puts her face to face with the scoundrel of all scoundrels, Han Solo, yeah. In Carbonite, as he's hanging, I think I believe, on the wall here at Jabba's palace, I believe. Well, it could be. Maybe there's, not. There's a I whole side is. story that goes on in the Marvel comics about Boba Fett delivering Han Solo to Jabba the Hutt. Like a million things happen. And Han in Carbonite gets passed around a little bit before Boba is finally able to reacquire the slab and deliver it to Jabba. There's a whole scene going on. Even Darth Vader plays a hand in this, according to the Marvel comics. So Hmm. I think that if they're going to be bringing in the crime syndicate of the Zarek Bash, which came from the Marvel comics, and it's from this time period. They're trying to stay consistent I with the comics. Okay. I mean, Han does get passed around a little bit before he finally gets reacquired by Boba Fett and delivered to Jabba. It wasn't, you know, no stop trip from <laughs> Bespin to Tatooine. There were a few stops along the way. And okay. some crazy crap happened. Like, have you seen the Black Series action figure of Boba Fett? And he's painted all black. Yes. And he comes with, a, yes. Yep. So that figure originates from this storyline in the Marvel comics. I see. So yeah. he does a he does a redeco of his armor at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how he disguises himself. Mm-hmm. It's about as effective as Clark Kent's eyeglasses, but... <laughs> It's all fiction, folks. It's the same armor, but just painted black. Oh, boy. Okay. I'm in. Out here, you live and die by your reputation. Oh, these guys. Yeah, yeah. More pikes. Are they pikes? I feel like they're pikes, aren't they? Yeah, but one appears to be wearing, like, ceremonial headdress. Um, that like might be some sort of priest or shaman or something. Possibly this is a new pike, a new type of pike, a super Could be. pike, <laughs> super it's pike, like, yeah, super pike. I think so. It's such a quick cut; it's hard yeah. to tell. But that that it's pikeish, very pike-ish. twin sons. So I believe we're at Tatooine here. You want to survive? No. And that was an aqualish. No, no, a Calamiri. Yes, yes, a Mon Cal in the canteen or no, someplace. The That's a pike right there, helmetless. Hmm. Okay. 
The full frontal pike is, I can't get used to it. I like them with the helmets. <laughs> What's with the full frontal? They're full showing frontal us too pike. much. Too much. New to this world. That's a big old pike, too. There's the always a big old pike. She has a little, like, cat-like thing. So is that going to be the thing now? With a lot of protagonists in Star Wars, they have a little pet with them. Is this, mm. this is all because of Filoni and those loth cats. <laughs> Look what he started. I don't know. I, I would, if I could exist in the Star oh, wait, Wars I, universe and go on adventures with my dog, that would be great. I, uh, I couldn't yeah, think of a right. better lifestyle. I mean, Chewie I, I really was couldn't. the was the original. Uh, he was the original dog co pilot. Wait a minute, are those Gamorian toes? I'm looking. Am I having to look at Gamorian toes? Yeah. Those are Gamorian toes. Definitely. Oh, jeez. With a Gamorian flip flop. Yeah. The- oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too much. Yeah, there you wow, go. Yeah, that's Jabba's she's getting Bella's. right. Oh, she's right over the rancor uh, pit here. Yeah, yeah. Step us. Yeah, she's she was smart to step in front of it. She was. I do love the little uh, current sense of humor, that ironic sense of humor that she displays here. I got a whole crew surrounding the. Okay, we're skipping that part. Yeah, there we go. We love that. Skippy. Very modern. Very modern. Okay. What else we got here? Sass. That's some sass. It's just been me and Nix. Me and Nix. Oh, Nix is the little uh, critter here. Yeah. Nix. She's looking befuddled as Nix runs in front of stormtroopers. It's like, it's yeah, put him on a leash. Oh, no. He just delivered her a blaster. What? This little guy is awesome. <laughs> Look at you him. See Watch, he delivers her a blaster. Nice. Play, play fetch. <laughs> I got to some heavy, to do that. heavy firepower in exchange. Oh, nice and Usually all I get back is a tennis ball. <laughs> she gets a blaster. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Oh, I do, I do like this Imperial shuttle here. Yeah. yeah That's one dock. of those big ones, those like troop transporter ones, isn't mm-hmm. it? Or is that a regular mm. sized one? It's hard yeah, to tell. It seems, I think it's, it seems like it's a, a normal, one. normal shuttle here to me. Have to to survive. This job is my one shot at freedom. At freedom. Oh, oh. Now, okay, that's a tell right there. Freedom. Why? Enslaved. A slave, an indentured servant of some sort, an or apprentice. Just in debt. Uh, Maybe just the debt that she right. owed, like she owes Jabba, like Han did. That's right. Or the Bad Batch owed Sid. Right, right. So that's that's curtailing her freedom. Mm-hmm. So she needs the big payday to get out from underneath the uh, the oppressive gang lord. But if we're going to pull this off, we need the right crew and the right ship. All right, so she's got to assemble the right crew, the right ship. And go off on their on their mission together. All she needs is a Wookiee, an old man wizard, a farm <laughs> kid, <laughs> a, a, and a, a tall droid, a short droid. I mean, it is very the, the archetypes are speaking at me very loudly and clearly here. That for sure, you know, she basically is Han Solo with boobies, <laughs> and she's going to assemble a crew that will have similar characteristics to those that follow the big three in the original trilogy. Yes. Hang on. I hire you because you are one of the best hunters in the Outer Rim. She's more connected than you let on, Sliero. Best is... Hmm. She's more connected than you let on, Sliero. That's right, Sliero. What is Sliero? Slero is the leader of the Besh. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Uh-huh. He's, he's top Besh. He's, he's, he's head of the Besh. Okay. He's the best of the Besh. He's mixed up in something bigger. The Outer Rim is a dangerous place. These visuals are outstanding. They really are. Commando droids... I mean, if you think about it, Jim, if this was an animated series, let's say this was a trailer for the next project from Lucasfilm Animation, we'd be blown away here. 
absolutely it's, blown it, away. It's, it looks great. It looks outstanding. And it feels like Star Wars. It does. It because does. it's it's giving a nod to those classic archetypes. For sure. And, and the tropes of Star Wars. But all I want is to live free. So I'm going to risk it all. Oh, sliding into the sarlacc. Was that a sarlacc? It is yeah. a sarlacc. Check that out. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Uh-huh. You see the so. teeth? Now, no beak. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is pre-special yeah. edition. Uh, yeah. I do got to I gotta admit, I do prefer Sans beak. As much as of a Little Shop of Horrors fan as I am, <laughs> I don't want it to uh, <laughs> come into my Star Wars I do like the Sands Beak Sarlacc yeah. Pit. Well, you know but, what uh, Billy D. Williams used to say about the Sands Beak oh, Sarlacc yeah. Pit. <laughs> well, I know a lot about you, George, after seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he got George's number after seeing that Sarlacc Pit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, check it out. Death Trooper. Skywalker. Those were cool little spider droids, small spider droids with oh, yeah. illuminated bodies. Is it like a those mini Bomar monk? Those aren't Bomar monks. Those are spider no, droids. No, those aren't yeah. Bomar monks, but they're similar in shape, but much smaller. Yeah. And they don't have the telltale brain aquarium up front right right the fishbowl the fi <laughs> with the brain in it <laughs> the brain aquarium <laughs> all right great dragon yep great so dragon lots of right familiar here. things lots of familiar imagery here speeder bikes um scoundrel great dragon i i like the pet that little pet, he has a tail. He's got like a lizard tail. Look yeah, at look that. At him. He's, he's, he's like an iguana. He's mm. kind of like this multi-eared iguana that pals around and brings blasters to k -Vess. And she seems cool. Like I said, a yeah. little derivative of Han Solo, of course. Definitely. But, um, Definitely. You know, it's, it's a different spin. And... Um, a game that appears to be steeped in all the tropes of Star Wars. Yep. Which is, uh, you know, it's it's that familiar neighborhood that you like to go back and visit. Uh, it's You know, it's Star Wars when you're there. There will be uh, ample moisture evaporators around <laughs> just to prove my point. But uh, it looks cool. So that Star Wars Outlaw is coming out at the end of the summer, August 30th. Will I have completed Jedi Survivor? Will I have completed it by then? That's the Will real you? question. But you can that place your bets on, on fan bets. I think they're taking you know, <laughs> the odds are very much against uh, my success, but you can put your money down. Yeah, great visuals. And uh, certainly, um, you know, this seems to indicate that there will be some canonical connections here. We already know that uh, Kira is uh, there's a still that's been making the rounds uh, that Kira yes. will actually be in this game. Kira. Right. Kira from Which, Solo. And if this is taking place between Re Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, you know, what role is she going to play? There's very little detail out there, and we don't even know uh, at this point if uh, the original actress... Uh, Amelia Clark. Amelia Clark, if she's going to even be playing the role. We don't know that, but Game Informer and some of the other gaming uh, trades have been uh, showing this image of Kira uh, in the game, but we don't know as to, you know, whether Amelia Clark's going to be involved or, you know, how, how big of a role she's going to play, but she's definitely Crimson in the Dawn, game. Dawn, baby. So, I mean, like I said, this is... Uh terrain that has been explored with the Marvel Star Wars comics over the last few years. If you are interested, check out their Syndicate War arcs and uh, go on the crazy journey with Frozen Han Solo. Is, <laughs> I mean, I wonder if anyone actually told him all the places he, he went to 
before uh, he got stole from Boba Fett, and then he ended up in the... Uh, there was an auction for him, actually. It, uh, an unreal. underworld auction. And see, and all Darth you Vader. thought was it was just a couple of years in between movies, <laughs> and, you know, that Boba Fett left Cloud City and went right to Tatooine. You don't know the half of it. No. It's like that Johnny Cash song. I've been everywhere, yeah. man. I've been everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a wild ride. So it appears that this video game will have several connections to uh, Marvel, Star Wars, and let's see how it all plays out. It looks interesting. So it like sure I said, does. If I finish Jedi Survivor by the end of August, then I, I might sign up for this game. I still have to play the Dark Forces Remastered, though. Now, that mm. was a game that meant a lot to me in the early to mid-'90s, was Dark Forces. Yeah, Played I remember Dark Forces 2. I got my very first computer. Yeah. It was an HP. Yeah. Yeah. I was heading off to college in 95, and it came with a free copy of Dark Forces 2. Wow. And, uh, boy, <laughs> I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was sure having fun playing that game. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was yeah, it was very I – mean, that was, you know, before special editions, before – uh, yeah. So much of the what we consider to be the Star Wars Renaissance, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't really know what I had there, to be honest with you. But uh, Jim, you were a little older forces. than me, so you you realized what was happening there in the in Star Wars. <laughs> I, I had full awareness. <laughs> um, but you know what was interesting about Dark Forces? It was released in 1995, and uh, I played it on my Gateway 2000. And uh, the terminal was uh, like five feet tall for the computer, <laughs> if I remember correctly. But uh, I loved it. And it was my first immersion into the Star Wars universe since Return of the Jedi, really. Yeah. This was 12 years after ROTJ. And um, I was just amazed to be exploring the environments, even as crudely animated as they were, you know, definitely heavily pixelated and it's a sign of the times. But to me, it was an incredible experience to, to have that at my fingertips in 1995. And uh, so I'm really interested in playing the remastered version of that game, which has just been released and uh, I haven't downloaded it yet. But I still do have the old Dark Forces on my desktop, just a <laughs> mouse click away whenever I want to go back to the mid-90s, almost 30 years ago. Yikes. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, not to be outdone, in addition to Star Wars Outlaws, there was a trailer drop for the second season of what we assumed was going to be and what was promoted to be to some extent, Tales of the Jedi, season right. two. But what a surprise, Jim. It's not Tales of the Jedi. It's Tales of the Empire. Yes. I, I mean, I opens heard up some, the whole Tales of uh, franchise. I heard some murmurs underneath the surface about this. But I was just as surprised as anyone when it was revealed that that was the next animation coming from Lucasfilm. And it's going to hit us just like less than a month from now. So Tales of the Empire. Does this, is this release in place of season two of Tales of the Jedi? Or do we still have that to look forward to? That's something I've not been able hmm. to find out. Is Tales of the Empire, is it just the Tales of franchise now? <laughs> You know? Well, it, it it makes sense. I mean, there's so many possibilities with it. Oh, tons! Of tales of the bounty hunters, tales of the Republic, tales of the New Republic, tales right. of the First Order, tales of the Jedi, tales. Yes, there's so many. It, it reminds me of those those books. Wasn't there uh, a tales of series of novels uh, back in the nineties? Uh, right. Tales yeah. of Jabba's Palace. I remember it being one of them. Tales so, of the Moss Eisley Cantina. Right. Tales of the Republic, Tales of the Empire. It was it was a like a compilation of stories in paperback. But this new Tales of the Empire seems to be heavily focused on two characters. Yes. Barris Offee, fallen Jedi Knight Barris Offee, who um, was uh, imprisoned 
at the end of Clone Wars Season 5 for orchestrating a bombing on the Jedi Temple in which Ahsoka Tano was set up to be the fall guy for. Right. And uh, she was in front of a tribunal, and it looked bleak for Ahsoka until Anakin Skywalker was able to get to the bottom of it and expose Barriss Offee as the culprit. And Barriss, she felt like the Jedi were fueling the Clone Wars, and she felt like Mm -hmm. the Jedi were being manipulated by the dark side. She felt like the Jedi were actually serving the dark side and promoting... Losing their way. Losing their way, promoting the violence of the war. And she wasn't too far off. The problem that Barriss made was, instead of investigating it properly, she embraced the dark side herself, which is (laughs) always a big mistake, especially for someone like Barisafi, anger, who, you know, fear, suffering. That's that's the way it goes. She'd never been the same after the brain worms. Remember that the, <laughs> oh, the uh, brain worms. Yes, the brain invasion from season two of Clone Wars, or maybe it was no. I think it was season two. The uh, on Geonosis there, right? Right. It was yeah. yes, yes. Which was the fallout of that incredible. The uh, zombie mission, arc. <laughs> uh, Battle of Point Rain episode that was out, out, just outstanding. Um, Clone Wars, you know, Jason, it's it's really interesting to go back and start binging your way through that series. If you haven't done it All these years yet. later, you know, all these years later, because for as well as you think you know them, it still hits you with a freshness and just great Star Wars storytelling. Yeah, sure, it was a little patchy at times, but when when the Clone Wars was hitting it on all cylinders, what a great series that was. Some of the finest Star Wars storytelling in any format. So that's where you get the setup for Barriss Offee, though. We haven't seen her since the end, uh, the, the conclusion of season five when she was imprisoned. And, uh, you know, she, she took the hit for that explosion on the Jedi Temple. Clearing Ahsoka Tano's name, but Ahsoka said, I don't want none of you guys because nobody had my back in this thing. And so she walked away from the Jedi Order altogether. Now, I disagree with Ahsoka. I think Anakin had her back. Anakin's the one who, he blew the whole thing wide open and exposed Barriss Offee. Uh, but that uh, wasn't good enough for Ahsoka. She was just done with the whole thing. She figures if it happened once, it could happen again. And so she didn't want to have anything to do with the crusty old Jedi. And 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 she <laughs> might have been actually having, you know, a sense of their eventual demise. I think that and Barris the Force and Ahsoka were sort of, I think in a way, Jim, they were sort of sensing the same thing. Yes, but their interpretations of it were a, a, a bit different. But right. uh, Barris Offee certainly has. Ma- you know, if you're scratching your head, saying, "Well, why are they doing a Tales of the Whatever series and focusing on Barris Offee?" She has huge ramifications on Star Wars canon because of her impact on ah- Ahsoka Tano, and they're continuing it uh, through this through this series. So, if you think that it ended with her being imprisoned. Uh, that's just the that's just the beginning, right? So I, apparently, then the Sith and the Inquisitors were able to sink their teeth into Barriss Offee while she was in prison. They just said, "Hey, you know, we're her counselors now. <laughs> you know, mm, right? We're, we're advocates for Barriss Offee now." She was once a prisoner of the Republic, and now she's a prisoner of the Empire, and so of yeah. course. They're going to be going through the the data banks and seeing who is in custody and what use they might be to the new goals of the prevailing powers. Right. So I put this on the timeline somewhere within 10 years prior to A New Hope to five years, anywhere from like 10 to five years prior to A New Hope. The rise of the Inquisitors is essentially mm-hmm. what I think the focus of the Barris Offee stories in Tales of the Empire is going to be all about. So let's take a look at the uh, trailer. We'll try to burn through it and provide some observations and insights. Well, do way. we before we do that? Do we want to talk about 
because we know this will be likely if it follows suit of Tales of the Jedi. Three episodes will focus on Barriss Offee. Yes. Three episodes will focus on Morgan Elsbeth. This is true. I so, did neglect to bring her up. Uh, yeah. we, we we may want to break that down a little bit. So what do we what do we know? What what don't we know about Morgan Elsbeth? We know that she's a night sister. We know that she has loyalty to the the whole legacy of Dathomir. Dathomir was wiped out during the Clone Wars. The witches of Dathomir were destroyed by the forces of General Grievous and the battle droids. Right. Uh, this was an arc, Jim, I believe it was supposed to happen in the Clone Wars, but the sh- series was canceled, and I believe that the Battle of Dathomir or the destruction of Dathomir was covered in a comic book at some point. Oh, that Darth Maul book? I think yeah, so. I think you're right. I think you're right. I'm going to have to recommit that to my personal canon. And I've read that thing like three times. And so for some reason, it doesn't stick. Maybe if it was an actual animated show, it would stick <laughs> with me a little bit better. But um, yeah, that was one of those discarded storylines. And so with that, you know, the separatists are the ones who are responsible for the destruction of Dathomir and pretty much the extinction of the Night Sisters. And Morgan Elsbeth is one of the sole survivors. So this series is going to establish how she then connects to the Empire and Grand Admiral Thrawn and um, might even tell her personal story about what happened on Dathomir when the Separatists attacked based on some of the imagery we're going to be seeing in this trailer. I believe that's the fact. Backstory for Ahsoka. Definitely backstory for Ahsoka. Some of the frustrations the we had with the with that first season of Ahsoka was that uh, so much of it was buried in the lore, so much of it was happening uh, in the past of the storytelling, and very little of it was happening in the present. There was so much that you needed to bring in with you and there was so much that needed to be inferred that it sometimes was challenging. And it seems like this Tales of the Empire is an attempt to uh, connect some of those dots for us. Right. Particularly right. the relationship between Thrawn and Elsbeth. And then, of course, they'll mix in Palpatine's grand plan to clone himself once he dies. <laughs> so there'll be threads of that in this show as well, because there has to be threads of that in every Lucasfilm production. Even the stuff that has nothing to do with Star Wars. I think they even talked about Palpatine's clone in the Willow series. And it's like, what? Who's Palpatine? Well, don't they worry gotta about explain it. We got to explain Palpatine has the returned. Swiss cheese mess of a sequel trilogy that we created. We're going to spend the rest of our existence trying to fill those holes. <laughs> All right. Well, here it is. This is the official trailer for the Disney Plus series, Tales of the Empire, premiering on May the 4th. Let's check it out. Why do you seek imperial favor? Thrawn right. and Elspeth. Why do you seek imperial favor? This is Thrawn and Morgan, I, I would assume a younger Elsbeth. We were wondering, Jim, you know, throughout the the uh, Rebel Force Radio uh, Ahsoka after shows, what is the connection between Thrawn and Morgan Elsbeth? Why, yeah. why that loyalty? Why is... So it's good to see here in Tales of the Empire that we might see the beginnings of that. Um, If you have the subtitles on, which we don't have here, but if you have the subtitles, you'll notice that in this sequence, he's not Grand Admiral Thrawn. He's just Admiral Thrawn at this point, which makes us, leads us to believe that this is obviously uh, prior to, you know, much prior to the events of the Ahsoka series. Right. Like I said, I'm I'm placing this the series of these events, you know, five to ten years prior to the events of A New Hope. So Thrawn hasn't worked his way up the Imperial ladder. He's still just Admiral, not Grand Admiral. And you'll see he's wearing the olive drab uniform mm. as opposed to the white one that a Grand Admiral wears. So this is the origin of his relationship with Morgan Elsbeth and quite possibly the origin of who Thrawn is and how he rises to the Imperial ranks. All right, Flashback we see some to battles the Clone going Wars. on here. Clone Wars, yep. We've got Battle uh, 
Yep, battle droids. Uh, the the uh, what are the what are the big beefy ones? Super battle droids. Super battle droids, right? <laughs> all right. Years ago, my people were all but destroyed. The so destruction. This, this of is Dathomir. likely that yes, the, the destruction of Dathomir here that we're seeing, uh, which we would have seen had the Clone Wars continued. Yes, but uh, they did not. Yes, Morgan all Elsbeth. Destroyed. Not now, a character we knew in the Clone Wars, though. Right. So, and here's a younger yeah. Morgan. And notice that she has the markings of the uh, the Death Marian witches. Right. Which we so don't we see. Gonna, right. Uh, later we're going to learn, like, they, they apply that stuff before the game. Like the eye black underneath the eyes of an NFL player, you know, <laughs> right. he doesn't always have it, but when it's game time, he's got that stuff on his face. That's how it is. Or, you know, like tribal war paint. Sure. My anger. Mm. So Death total destruction birds. happening here. Uh, this guy looks a little, I don't know what, you know, he's an incinerator. Uh, I wouldn't call him a trooper. He he lacks right. that kind of uh, mystique and cool look. He looks more like uh, somebody who works down in the boiler room. Yeah, right. The, yeah, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's Raymond down from the boiler room. <laughs> and he's got a flamethrower. Look out. Yeah. My anger gives me strength. Mm. So here's Morgan Elsbeth looking at the the carnage and the destruction, perhaps here of uh, of Dathomir in the aftermath. Yeah, and that's what's happening. It is that strength I offer the Empire. Ah, okay. So here's a continuation of that discussion. So what fuels her loyalty to Thrawn? Her loyalty to Thrawn is based on. Her aligning with him to get ultimate revenge on those who brought destruction on Dathomir. Jim, as yeah. you said, the separatists, which are uh, likened to be the the rebellion. Uh, many of the re the separatists mm -hmm. became uh, part of the rebellion. So she's aligning herself with the empire, which is the former republic. Right, right. Like the the witches of Dathomir, I don't think they really leaned one way or another when it came to galactic politics. Definitely non-political, I would say. Yeah, but now she's thrust upon the galaxy because her home has been destroyed as a result of the Clone War and the attack of the Separatists. So she goes to the biggest power that's on the map, and that's at this point in time the Galactic Empire, how she meets Thrawn, how she, you know, comes into his orbit or how he comes into her orbit, that's yet to be determined. But I think it's great. I, I love the idea of a story that reveals how these two became connected because they obviously had a strong connection in the Ahsoka series, but we had nothing to... We had no foundation for that. None. Which is, I think, why this story is being told in this way. Outside the fact that she did have that shipyard, and so she was fueling the Imperial war machine. Yes. We know that. Right. But, you know, I mean, even how, did, how does a night sister become Yeah, she'd elevated connected? her social stature in, in some way. What was the name of that planet that she was running uh I believe it was called Elsbeth Land. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't yeah, remember. I know. Yeah, the, the the planet where she had the shipyard. Yes. Yeah, so she that was, was Star Wars twenty twenty three. I've moved forward. <laughs> Offer accepted. Uh, just just a little uh, a point that it is definitely Lars Mikkelsen uh, providing the voice of Thrawn and the original Morgan Elsbeth actress whose name I don't have in front of me, but uh, Diana Lee and Asanto. Of course. Uh, yes. Yes. Bruce Lee's goddaughter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Son of yeah. Uh, daughter of Dan in Asanto, who is a martial arts legend. Mm. Yes. And, and Lars so, Mickelson, their brother of Mads Mickelson. 
<laughs> from Lashif. Andor in that James Bond movie where he pulled right? his, his <laughs> cheekbone out of his mouth. <laughs> On May 4th. I'm here to present you with an opportunity, Barris. All right. So Barris oh, Offy. Here we got Barris Offy uh, flanked by two of the, uh, well, the most elite clone troopers, the red troopers. Yeah. These are, these are Palpatine's guys, are they not? Yeah. Yeah. The shock troopers from Revenge of the Sith. So this place is the timeline very close, if not within the same time frame of episode three. So we're nearing the end of the Clone Wars. Clones are still prevalent. Uh, Barris is in prison. Who's coming to visit her? Ooh. Barris shave her head. She's getting her freak on in the prison. All right, so that's she this shaved is Barris her head. here. This is uh, one of the Inquisitors. This is the oh what, uh, the seventh sister. Oh yes, that is an Inquisitor. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So. So, so this is the seventh maybe, sister. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, a couple of years, maybe like Bad Batch era or a few years beyond that. Again, getting the timeline closer to A New Hope as opposed to Revenge of the Sith. I think maybe this is like five years outside of Revenge of the Sith with mm. the presence of the shock troopers there and the presence of an Inquisitor. The Inquisitors didn't emerge immediately after the the rise of the Empire. It took a few years for that program to get underway. And mm -hmm. I think we'll be learning about it in Tales of the Empire, about how it got off the ground. Again, the Marvel comics did cover some of that territory. But, uh, yeah, to have this Inquisitor then approach Barris while she's in prison tells me this is three to five years after Revenge of the Sith at the very earliest. Eris. Just be glad you're not a... Oh, so I stopped that right before there's a key bit of dialogue here as we see the shackles, a very Palpatine-esque, being released by the Force from Barriss Offee from the Inquisitor. You know, sort of the you no longer need those. Yeah, right. Just be glad you're not a Jedi anymore. So Just be glad green. you're not a Jedi anymore. Who is the green? Was that her? Was that Barris? That's Barris. Barris uh, being oh, escorted sure it, yeah, out of sure prison. Uh, okay, I thought she clones. had a shaved head in the previous frame, but no, in the again, previous the frame, she had like a hood. She had like a little hood going on. Oh, I see. Okay. She had a hoodie. Uh, yes. She's got like a shower cap on. <laughs> uh, so the clone trooper, uh, voiced, of course, by D. Bradley Baker. Just be glad you're not a Jedi anymore. Just be glad you're not a Jedi anymore. Two okay. stories. That's Morgan Elspeth. All right, now we're, now we're flashing back to Morgan Elspeth. So, Jim, they're combining, uh, interestingly enough here, they're combining the stories of Morgan Elspeth with Barris Offee. What mm. connection might they have? Now, previously in Tales of the Jedi, season one, we saw the rise of Ahsoka Tano with the fall of Count Dooku. Yes. Uh, what, what are we seeing here? Perhaps somehow these intertwine mm. or there's something to be learned from seeing them both in juxtaposition. Not yeah. sure. We'll see how these two stories intertwine if they do indeed at all. It's not necessarily you know, in stone that they will. Yeah, again, we're looking back at uh, some Clone Wars activity. So this is, again, probably the fall of Dathomir to the Separatists in the Clone Wars. I will. And Barris, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Morgan was there. Fulfill my destiny. Oh, now, okay, so we're seeing two different Morgans here. Here's young Morgan, mm -hmm. uh, obviously at the site of the fall of Dathomir. And then we have uh, perhaps an older Morgan. Now we're switching from the destruction of a planet or a village to what appears to be the destruction of maybe a, a, a ship of some sort behind her. Maybe. So yeah, we see it does just look sort of like, uh, yeah, yeah, it does look like some sort of starship or uh 
weird building is it that looks like more like a vehicle is being engulfed in flames along with a village if you look to the left and the right i that mm. looks like homes being burnt so it looks like the destruction of a full town so and remember at- when we meet up with morgan in the mandalorian season 2 chapter 13 the jedi She's on that planet that's a complete, it's a, the wasteland, it's a wasteland, you know? The forest is mm-hmm. all burnt out and stuff. And it's on, that's the planet Corvus. So maybe we're looking at- Corvus, yes. The destruction of Corvus. First we see the destruction of Dathomir, Morgan Elspeth's home planet. And then we see the destruction of Corvus, which is Morgan El- Elspeth's current planet, at least by the time of the Mandalorian. Where she takes control and becomes a magistrate or whatever the, yes, the, the title magistrate, is. Yeah. Yes. To me. And she has that spear, that Beskar spear. Oh, right. The Beskar spear. She did spear. have that. Yes. There it is. So, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is uh, magistrate era Morgan Elspeth. One path. Oh, Grand Inquisitor, uh, voiced by Jason Isaacs back right. in the uh, in the days of the of the Rebel series. Yeah, I'm and happy then, to see him return because I thought they killed off the character way too quickly in Rebels. He only made it through that first season, and then there was this revolving door of other Inquisitors, some lesser than others. I thought this character was kind of compelling and de- deserved maybe a longer run. I, but he was I killed agree. off very early. I agree. And of course he shows up in Kenobi in live action. Yes, but th- that story happens previously to the events of Rebels. Correct. Correct. Yes. So this Grand Inquisitor we're seeing is the the same Grand Inquisitor. Yeah. It's it's the he, same. He's, right, he, right. he's, he's the um, OI, original Inquisitor. <laughs> right. Mercy only breeds defeat. You know, I don't think that's Jason Isaacs. I think that's Rupert Friend doing the voice. Oh, I, I, I could have sworn I read something that said it was Jason Isaacs. Really? I, I was wondering the same thing. Listen to the voice, though. Yeah. See, only breeds defeat. I don't think that sounds like Jason Isaacs. Jason Isaac has a much deeper voice. Uh, but this feels like more like Rupert Friend, as we heard I in, agree. in Ahsoka. I agree, only but maybe he's, try- he's, he's mimicking the delivery that was established then for the character huh. in... Right, in the because uh, that's the last time we saw him, and maybe yeah. more closely in timeline to this. You know, but uh, yeah, look at this bevy of lightsaber hilts. I've got a bad feeling about this. I think these are. I don't think these are new lightsaber hilts. I think these are lightsabers that have been taken from uh, Jedi that have been uh, put on ice or an amber or whatever it is. Maybe. Um, or it, remember, General Grievous used to brag about his collection. Right. Where did that collection go? <laughs> <laughs> after Perhaps after he was defeated, where did that collection go? Maybe uh, this Inquisitor, uh, in, he, he acquired them on eBay or something. <laughs> on Grief Bay. Star Wars eBay. Uh, Breeds defeat. But I will help you overcome this weakness. I think that's Rupert Friend. I I could be wrong. Uh, uh, Jim, you were saying that you feel like you saw that Jason Isaac was yes uh, reprising the role. Okay, so it very well yeah. maybe Jason Isaac. The cast but, list uh, does reveal him. Okay, as all right. The so it's not Rupert. Voice of in the Inquisitor, but again, he might be mimicking the sound of Rupert Friend's character, hmm. just to try to maintain consistency. We hear he's training Barris. Trying to bring the dark side out of her, bring her anger out of her so she can tap into the dark side more efficiently and become an inquisitor herself. 
Oh, look at this. You see this Ooh. little blood splatter? Blood, blood. It's like an NHL game. Blood on the yeah, ice. Yeah, look at that. And she looks up. Oof. This is intense. I got, a, I got my nose is bleeding. <laughs> I got a bloody nose. You said the Empire would help to change things. Everything. There, we're on Corvus oh. now. We're on Corvus. Mm -hmm. This Haven't is the very we same. seen this dude before? Th this Asian yeah, he, dude? He, who? The Asian dude there. Behind. Um, I, I, well, he was, he was. Um, I, I think, the, the original mayor of the city on Corvus. And he was imprisoned. And the Mandalorian That's was right. able to yes. liberate him once he overthrew Magistrate Elsbeth. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, he was like the original mayor of the town. That's so this right. is a full backstory for okay. Morgan Elsbeth and where she is when we eventually meet her in Chapter 13, The Jedi, Season 2 of The Mandalorian. At a cost. Beskar Spear. Mm-hmm. There you see that ship exploding, My which is... Probably the fire she's walking away from. You see that ship right there. This is probably right. the explosion is probably what generates that right here. That forest wide fire that we see Morgan Elspeth walking away from. So we're gonna see the origin of why Corvus looks all burnt out. That forest is all burnt out, and it looks like Armageddon took place on that planet. When the Mandalorian lands, here we see it's it's a vibrant, alive forest, green, leafage, foliage. <laughs> uh, it's all there, and uh, this is where why it isn't there. Hmm. <laughs> the, the the destruction of the ship. Here, oh, Grievous! <laughs> More Clone Wars flashbacks. <laughs> Oh, nice. Swank, do that again. <laughs> that's probably the best impression that's ever happened <laughs> on these airwaves <laughs> since the history of podcasting. I mean, that was, that was, that was, a, a lot of people loved your Kenny Baker from a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I, I've heard more than a few comments about that. <laughs> but I think this general grievous asthma cough is going to really uh it's going to win you the governor's award i appreciate so, it yes. all right grieve is coming up on uh what looks like to be a uh a young oh, has been burning. yeah i think that's morgan elsbeth right? that's more approaching she oh, actually and battles the, grievous since i was a child yes we got the spinny sabers going on here Interesting. Wow, look at this. So a big duel between Grievous and Morgan Elsbeth. Awesome. I'm in. I'm in for yeah, this. Yeah. Since I was a child, you cannot stop what has begun. Were these battle droids I see? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah, they're yeah, they're all folded up, you know how mm -hmm. they do. Right. And then they un unfurl themselves. And uh, unleash their destructive power. Then we see Barris Offy with one of those Inquisitor oh, spinny blades. Yeah, the helicopter saber. Yeah, so Barriss, she oh wow. She definitely graduates to uh, the role of Inquisitor in this series. For sure. Now. Oh, now who's this? So somebody is opening a can of... Uh, Force whoop ass here, or some sort of uh, f f force power on these uh, super battle droids. Is this Barris? Is this uh, is this Morgan? Who is this? Look at that. Big mystery. Yeah, it seems like very Jedi mm -hmm. with the hood up and the cloak and everything. Who could it be? Who's what Jedi has survived in this time period? Hmm. Kenobi. I don't know. <laughs> you must face one final test to join us. Well, look at this trial right here yeah, to join is... us to join the Inquisitor ranks. Who do we have here? We've got 
I'm assuming that this is Barris facing off against another uh, potential candidate here. For, right. Uh, That's probably it. These are probably the two top graduates of the inquisitorious class and they have to <laughs> duel it out to see yeah. who will be, who will fill the role, the final opening of the inquisitorium or is it inquisitorious? The, the inquisitorium is the physical location. I think oh. the inquisitorious is the uh, organization. Is the organization. Well, you still need a spot in both of them. Right. So, so it looks like a duel to the death is uh, going to happen. Boy, this looks like a great uh, series here. Uh, the shorts will probably be, you know, similar to Tales of the Jedi in the range of 14 to 18 minutes long. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe they might surprise us with uh, longer episodes. It is time you meet your new master. Oh, boy. Here's the mother load. Okay, so we got Vader coming through, but let's look at the lineup here of is Inquisitors. I hate Barris, to say it. Maroc. Yeah, I was going to say, is that a Maroc I see? Yes, yes, it is. So he is a legitimate Inquisitor. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll find out what why he dissolved into greenish-black smoke when... He was defeated by uh, Ahsoka. And then you have the other Inquisitor who was from Tales of the Jedi. This is the Inquisitor Ahsoka killed in the final Tales of the Jedi episode. Oh, when right. When he shows up on, on that, that farm. Planet. Yeah. And he showed up and destroyed the trash, the place, set it all aflame. And then she, you know quickly defeated him. So this stuff is taking place prior to the events of that particular episode of Tales of the Jedi. Here's Barris in the lineup. Traitor. Yeah. Dirty traitor. I'm, I'm, no, I'm still bitter about it. I don't like how she framed Ahsoka. I don't like all this stuff. She attacked Anna. Watch that last episode of season five of Clone Wars. It's called The Wrong Jedi. Mm -hmm. And it features this great saber duel with Barris and Anakin. Barris with two red bladed sabers that she stole from Asajj Ventress. And Anakin using Barris's Jedi saber and his own. So it's four sabers, one duel. Two mm -hmm. contestants. It's great. It's really great. All kneeling before the entry Zion. of the Dark Lord. Long live the Empire. Wow. We got Tales of the Jedi sort of burning out to create Tales of the Empire. May the 4th on Disney+. Plus. Uh, wow. Wow. Cool, cool, cool stuff. All right. Well, well, well we're we'll going to get together in your hotel room on <laughs> the morning of May the 4th in Bristol. Yes. And we're going to watch these suckers together as we eat our $50 omelets and drink our $10 <laughs> cups of coffee. Uh, some mimosas there, maybe a Bloody Mary. Who knows? Uh, maybe. Man, we got we got a full day ahead of us, so I don't know. That's true. That's true. I don't know about that. The mimosas might have to wait till post-show. But... Uh, <laughs> Definitely, we'll pr we'll provide at least a review where we scrape the surface of these episodes. I don't know if we'll go full deep in total analysis when we're on stage in Bristol because we have a lot of things on our agenda. For but, sure, uh, you know, but we'll we'll be up to speed just in case anybody you know in the audience or one of the VIPs might want to throw us a curveball about Tales of the Empire just to see if we're up to speed, you know. Just right. because we're on the road doesn't mean we're going to take a step back. <laughs> we're still going to be Star Wars 24-7, whether it be in Chicago, Ohio, or Bristol, Connecticut. <laughs> Trust me on that. 
People are lining up for Star Wars, and everybody is uh, excited, especially the Rebel Force Radio Podcast. And yeah, those podcasts are great. I got to get this podcast. Your source for the Force. All right, hey, before we uh, wrap things up, we do have one bit of news that we want to bring to you. And uh, I think this is going to be of welcome news for a lot of Star Wars fans that James Mangold's uh, Dawn of the Jedi film now has a co-writer, and it's none other than Bo Williman. If that name sounds familiar to you, it should. He is uh, one of the creators of the uh, incredible series House of Cards from Netflix, uh, iconic series, sort of along with Sopranos and a few others, ushered in this new golden era of television. But more importantly, he was a co-writer on season one of Andor. And not just any episodes of Andor, you know, episodes like, uh, what what do we got here? Yeah, Narkeena 5, um, One Way Out, Nobody's Listening, some of the, 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 probably the most impactful and iconic episodes of Andor season one, all the, the whole prison arc. Yeah. So, and, and Bo was very instrumental in this very important, according to Tony Gilroy, uh, he said, as far as Williman's importance to creating that story, he said that uh, Bo's skill was plotting and using a whiteboard. Williman questioned uh, what they were trying to do thematically. And the writers always approach things from an emotional perspective. Willem and the writers aimed to create a character-based story that felt true. And he would question how one became a rebel and what sacrifices they would make. So um, when we think about things like uh, Luthen's big monologue yes. uh, and some of these huge moments that really grounded Andor in this sort of realism uh, that's Bo Williman. And now we got Bo Williman teaming up with James Mangold, writing a Star Wars movie about the, the whole beginnings of the Force. Yeah. This is some of the best news I think we've had as Star Wars fans in a long time with these uh, movies and television shows in development. Yeah, as far as the pedigree of, of Bo goes, I mean, he uh, plotted out all of that uh, Narkina prison break. Famous lines like, I can't swim, came from <laughs> right. Bo. Right. The uh, incredible monologue that um, Kino Loy gave as he was addressing all the other prisoners over the PA system. Bo wrote it. And, and of course, you brought up Luthen Rails plea essentially to that imperial informant and and, mm -hmm. and and him explaining his motivations for wanting to take down the empire he painted quite the picture of 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 the things he's sacrificed to fight the empire to this imperial informant that was stuff that bo wrote and on top of that like you said jason creator of house of cards and also uh, one of the writers on a great show called severance which is a really wild concept about, uh, you know, leaving your body as your body goes to work <laughs> and then you, you reacclimate yourself with your physical self once your workday is over. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a wild concept. <laughs> but and, what does uh, this tell us, though, about Dawn of the Jedi? I, I feel what it tells us is that it's going to be closer to Andor than it is closer to anything else, perhaps. It, it we, might be a more mature take on Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Yes, yeah, more mature, a more grounded, cutting-edge look at the origin of the Force and the way people connect to it in the Star Wars galaxy. That could very well be the case. James Mangold, he said he was going to write it. Mm -hmm. He said on a couple of occasions that he was going to write it. So the introduction of a co-writer in this case um, surprises me a little bit. But Mangle's dance card is so full as he is currently shooting the Bob Dylan film with Timothy Chalamet. And he's on the hook for a Swamp Thing movie for DC. Oh, yeah, right. And nobody's really sure. I think most Arrow's point in the direction of Mangold attacking the Dawn of the Jedi film following the production of the Bob Dylan film. 
and then Swamp Thing will happen afterwards. Because they're mm. targeting, no official announcement, but most people are betting on the fact that this will be the film that's released December 2027. Right. The Dawn of the Jedi. So the clock is ticking. You know, Daisy Ridley still has not read a script for the new Jedi Order film, which mm. is supposed to come out December 2026. There's still not been a script presented to Daisy Ridley. She says she's going to see it next month. She said that last year. So <laughs> I don't know the status of this script for the new Jedi Order. I also know that the writer, Stephen Knight, has a Peaky Binders feature film that oh, he's signed up to do. I see. So okay. either he gets the new Jedi Order script done, or there's going to be another announcement about a new writer for that film, and that film will get pushed back to probably 2028 or something. Yeah. But I think well, that, uh, and then they might move the new Jedi Order film up. And if uh, James Mangold is working on Swamp Thing, they're going to find a different director. <laughs> so oh, boy. I think we're, well, we're, we're hmm. getting into the swamp again with Lucasfilm. Uh, indeed. But, uh, uh, one thing's for sure is it seems like Mandalorian and Grogu is still confirmed for that May 22nd, oh, yes, 2026. Yes. That's a done deal. But after that, the December 18th, 2026, and the December 17th, 2027, those... Uh, Hold dates are still up for grabs. We don't know. It's going to be a race. Right. Is it going to be the Mangold film or the Daisy Ridley Ray film? If I had to put money on it right now, I would say the Mangold film. Well, you know. It seems um, to have the momentum. Well, at least it has this edition of a co-writer, which makes right. it feel a little more real. Because you know as well as I do that Mangold hasn't really sunk his teeth into it yet doesn't seem like it right and so there might be some conceptual stuff going on within the ranks of ilm and lucasfilm and their story group but when mangold gets there i i, I who knows you know he might erase everything they came up with and says no we're going in this direction and mm. they're gonna say the hell you say and they're gonna fire him and bring in <laughs> ron howard <laughs> Well, I, I got to say, though, it, it none of that uh, it takes away from, honestly, I'm more excited about Bo Williman and having one of the Andor writers involved. Who knows? Maybe they get Tony Gilroy to replace James Mangold. I don't know. I, 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 I don't have anything against uh, James Mangold. I enjoyed the last Indiana Jones film. thought it was fun. Logan um, was really great. Logan, yeah, right? Ford versus Ferrari. So I, I don't have films. any. No, no axe to grind against Mangold, but I'm very excited about having one of those Andor writers in there making a Star Wars movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like to see him come up the ranks. I like to see him climb the ladder of Star Wars. For sure. And somebody who has previous experience in that environment. I think is a, a big positive, a big positive. Agreed. All right. Wow. What a jam packed, uh, crazy, exciting uh, episode here of Rebel Force Radio. <laughs> Chewie, get us out of here. Uh, so much news, so many things to unpack. Um, and this is just the beginning. We got the home stretch of Bad Batch season three, the final season. Uh, coming up over the next couple of weeks. And it all leads, all roads lead to Bristol, Connecticut and Rebel Force Radio Live in Bristol for the May the 4th weekend. It's going to be happening. Make sure you're there. Go to rebelforceradio.com. Look for the Star Wars Day a graphic there on the right rail. Get all the details that you need. Uh, tickets, all of that information is available. Cannot wait. Uh, we've got news from several of the long-term Rebel Force Radio uh, listeners, followers. Uh, they're going to be there. It's going to be a reunion of sorts. We haven't been together in a couple of years doing a live show, so it's really going to be something special. Uh, as always, you can get more Rebel Force Radio in your life by checking us out on Patreon. As we said earlier in the program, you can get that entire WGN exclusive 
exclusive interview uh, from back in the day in uh, 1977 with Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill. They're in those WGN studios in Chicago uh, almost 50 years ago. That entire <laughs> audio can be uh, yours if you're a member of Patreon supporter at the All Access tier or above. You can also get access to things like the Q&A. We're up to 200 episodes, the 200th featuring call screener and official program observer Tyler Page. Check that all out on Patreon. It's podcasts that you can't get anywhere else, only by being a supporter of Rebel Force Radio on Patreon. In addition, as we do these live shows, there's special perks that are available. When we do the uh, uh, after shows, you can make sure that you're at the head of the line for the call-in queue. You just tell Tyler you're a Patreon supporter and he'll pop you on. Uh, also, we're on YouTube. You can check us out, youtube.com slash Rebel Force Radio. Please subscribe, like, comment on those videos today. Helps all the algorithms. Helps more people discover this podcast. Follow us on our socials, on Instagram, on X, on uh, 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 Facebook. It's all available for you. Uh, and our official web- website for all things and everything, Rebel Force Radio, rebelforceradio.com. But if you want to really help us out at RFR, the best thing you can do is do what you're doing right now. Keep listening. Keep referring Rebel Force Radio to your friends, your family, your coworkers that love Star Wars. Say, you know what? If you like Star Wars, you've been watching The Bad Batch, you're excited about the new movies coming out, Mandalorian and Grogu, you got to listen to Rebel Force Radio please do that. And if your podcatcher of choice allows you to do so, we'd love to have your review. We read them all. Just one simple rule, please. Make them good. And that'll do it for us this week. We'll see you next week for more Bad Batch After Show and Rebel Force Radio, the weekly podcast. We'll see you next time for RFR. I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember, the Force will be with you always. I told you they would do it.